Okay, so our goal for today is to make a deeper friendship with functions and the uh, relationship between functions and objects uh, as a basis for um, some constructs of the functional programming. Okay, so there are three aspects. Um, as we <coughs> knew from the, the end of the uh, last class, uh, we just explored the syntax uh, for defi defining functions. Okay, so what we said is that uh, in JavaScript, uh, as in any other language, uh, we have uh, the possibility of defining a function, which is a block of code with a list of parameters, and uh, uh, with a body of instructions uh, that will uh, may return a value okay, to the caller. So that's a quite uh, normal concept in every in every uh, or most programming languages, okay? What we saw is that we have different uh, syntax, uh, uh, syntactic ways of declaring functions, okay? The first one is actually a declaration, okay? It declares a new name, a new object of type function. It gives a name to it, but the other ones uh, are expressions from the syntax point of view. So they are, uh, a syntax for creating a new object that we can then store into a variable, or we should store into a variable, otherwise uh, it would be lost forever. So uh, even in this uh, normal syntax, you have, you have function as a constructor operation that builds a new object of type function, and then we store this object into a variable, fn, and the syntax for storing into a variable is identical if we are creating a, a, a string or a function, okay? So we have a value, an object value of type function. Now, that will be important. Then we have variations of, of this uh, syntax uh, with an optional label or just with the arrow function, the arrow syntax, uh, which is simpler. Uh, they are nearly equivalent. There are some details about how arrow function works, uh, but we'll see them when we need uh, to make the distinction about uh, uh, the keyword this. Now, it's a combination of function and objects uh, that interact in a specific way, specifically for our functions. But let's not get into that for the moment. Uh, so this uh, was an example that we already saw where the same function is defined or in, in different ways. Well, it's not the same function, but uh, similar function for computing uh, the square the cube or the fourth power, for example, of, of a value, and just to put them side by side uh, to see that we can mix and match the different definitions and they do the, th the same thing. At the end, uh, we have a, a function fourth, uh, which is defined using the arrow, function, the arrow syntax, uh, and we can call it uh, normally, as we can call the function square, which is defined uh, uh, using the normal syntax. So when we call a function, we don't know and we don't care in which syntax it was defined because at the end we have an object of type function, maybe fourth, maybe square. And if it's an object of type function, we can apply the call operator, which is the couple of uh, parentheses, round parentheses, to execute the, a call to that object, the body of, of that object. Okay? So um, we can define them, them in a However we like, uh, as long as we have uh, the possibility of calling them exactly in the same identical way. And you see that also from the point of view of the of this, uh, storage of these objects, uh, they are all the like. No? There are th three variables that point to objects whose internal value is basically the body of the function itself. No? It's being stored by JavaScript, by the interpreter as a as a, in the same way. Hmm? So we, we must, in our mind, uh, start to make the distinction between the function itself, which is an object, and the variable currently pointing the, to the function, like we are doing with any other kind of objects. Variable and the object on the stack outside of it. Hmm? Because we'll make use uh, of this uh, separation to, to move function, function around a lot. Hmm? Uh, for arrow function, we have some uh, even more simplified syntax, 
uh, normally the syntax call for uh, a set of uh, parameters in parentheses and a body of the function between curly braces, okay? So that's the, the full syntax. Uh, there are some, uh, there's a, a shortcut, for example, if we only have one parameter, we can omit uh, the square, the, the round param parenthesis around that. So the arrow itself uh, is enough uh, for defining a function. Then this function may have only one parameter, and we can surround it or not with parentheses, or can have more parameters in those cases. Uh, the, the parentheses are, are mandatory, of course, and also when we have no arguments at all. And there's also a um, simplification on the body of the function itself uh, is quite, uh, uh, quite often the body of this function would co consist just of a single return statement. Okay, a function that just co uh, computes something, like, like computing the fourth power. So uh, with the arrow syntax, we are defining a function whose body, hmm, the body only contains one statement, and this statement is a return. In this case, uh, we can drop everything, <laughs> braces, return, semicolon, and just put the expression there like that. So this is a finally totally simplified syntax where we have only one argument, and so we don't need the wrong parentheses, and we only, have, we only have one return statement in the body, and so the braces are omitted and the return itself is omitted. So normally we have uh, the arrow function that points to a body of statements, a block of statements. The simplified version, the arrow points just to a, an expression. And this expression is implicitly returned by the function. So that's a return statement there which is invisible. Okay? But it's very compact, especially when we are asking for a function for doing some computation and so on. So why do I insist on a compact syntax of function? Because we are going to define function in every, uh, functions in every corner in our code. Uh, so having a compass synthesis will also help uh, uh, defining function on the fly, wherever uh, we need them. Um, okay, another detail on this slide is that uh, a return statement, uh, as in most languages, can only return one object, one value. And if we need to return more values, we can pack them into a, an array object, for example. And we, know, we already know that we can use the structuring and destructuring assignments just to unpack the result of the function in, a, for example, this function is returning two values, actually an array containing two values. And when we call the function, we are unpacking these two values in two separate variables, okay, with the destructuring assignment. So all those strange things about the assignments that we saw when we studied uh, arrays come out very, uh, very useful and handy in these cases. Okay, so uh, we, we understand later why something are, is useful. Hmm? Uh, well, functions are, function declaration are just defining a new object. So you can put that anywhere in your code. You can define a function that uh, inside contains another de function definition. Why not? No? It's just like defining a new array or a new string. Of course, the scope of this function definition would be only inside this block. So it's, uh, if it's something that is only needed inside here, we can define it here. We can use the arrow syntax. We can use the function syntax. They are all uh, interchangeable. Okay. Usually, when you are nesting something, we try to use the lightest syntax possible, but it's not mandatory. The interesting thing is that, uh, it's not in this example, but since we are defining the function inside the body of another function, well, let's see at this one, which has the, the braces. Any instruction inside these braces, of course, it can, it will access its own arguments, right, it's normal. But it may also access 
a and b, or any other variable defined in the scope of the containing function, of the external function. And this is something new. A function that is able to access some objects that don't belong to the body or to the definition of that function, but the body of the external function, the surrounding function. This is called, uh, this is a name, it's a very important mechanism uh, called closure. Okay? So let's spend uh, some, uh, some time and some example on this concept. This is the definition of closure, which by itself uh, doesn't tell us very much because it's very abstract. A closure is a name given to a feature, okay, it's a feature of the language, by which a nested function this one, square, okay? Executed after the execution of the outer function can still access outer function scope. So what is puzzling is this after. Okay, what we are saying is that we are defining a function here inside, nested inside another function. And this second function can be called after the external function has completed, has returned, no longer exists. Right? So it may seem strange that we can call an inner function, so an internal, a local variable, this function is identified by a local variable, and this can be called after this whole function has been returned, completed, destroyed. We should also destroy the internal variables. Why not? They are local. When the function dies, also the local variables will die. And they will, the local variables. But maybe not the objects uh, that are being referred by those local variables. We need some examples, right, to, to understand what is happening here. Um, here is some very simplified, in, in nearly useless, but it, we try to, to put together you know, the, the definition of nested functions and closures. So we are defining a function here which is called greeter, something that greets me. Hmm? Okay? Uh, this function uh, receives uh, an argument, my name. But the function doesn't. Uh, uh, create immediately a string. It creates a function that will return a string with the, my name. Hmm? So what we have here is that, oh sorry, my name is passed as a parameter and it's said here. Then we define an, in, an inner function that creates a string using my name. And we return the function. The return value of this function greeter is the object referred by hello, and this object is a function. So we have a function greeter that builds and returns a function. The return function is uh, internally called hello, but externally doesn't have a name anymore. It's just an object. Okay, we can have a function that returns an array. Does it bother us? No, we are, we are building an object and returning an object. Here, we are building an object, which is a function, and returning that object, which is a function. So, it should not surprise us that the return value of this function greeter, hello Tom, is stored in a variable, and this variable contains a reference to a function object. And so we can use and call this function. Okay, let, let's, this is just about the syntax, okay? Let's, later we'll, we'll uh, think about the, the semantics. Okay, we have a function, greeter, that does some computations, and at the end returns an object which happens to be a function. The caller 
receives this return value, stores into a variable, and since it's a function, it can call it. Seems logical, no? Strange, but logical. Consequential. Okay? Then why we are doing this is another topic. But we can do that. It's just an object. So it's possible for a function to return a function as a return value. And this return value, we are storing it in this variable, from this moment, it will, be, will behave like any other function that we, we define everywhere else in the code. It's just a function. Huh? Remember this picture here. We don't care where or how these functions were defined. We only care about having a reference to them so that we can call them. Okay? Okay, so that's the easy part. The stranger part is uh, what is this function doing? This function doesn't have any argument. Okay, nothing strange about that. It may have or may not have any argument. We don't, it's not relevant in this moment. And it, whenever we call this function, and we are calling it here and there many times, uh, it will do something different. It will create a string by concatenating hello with my name. What is my name? My name is not a parameter of this function. It's not an argument of this function. It is the name of a variable in this enclosing context. My name is a local variable of greeter. It's neither a parameter nor a local variable of this new function, which doesn't have a name, by the way. Hmm? So this is what we, say, we, uh, we said before. A nested function can access the objects uh, defined in the outer function's context. We are doing that just right now. This variable, my name, refers uh, to the current value of the argument of the function name, which most likely will point, uh, will refer to a string object. OK? So what we are doing here is we are using a reference to a name, which is stored there. But we are not using the value of the name. Because this instruction here is not being executed when we are executing the, the greeter function. I'm executing a greeter function. This greeter function contains three statements. An assignment, an assignment, a return. This code here is parsed, it's stored away, and it's not being executed, right? We will execute this code when this function will be called. We are not calling this function yet. We are just building it, right? So my name is not the current value, the current string that we received in this function. Because this, this code is not being executed when we call the greeter, the greeter function. That my name is a reference to a variable. Defined with a usage of this variable. So what happens is that when this function is called later on down here, this code will, exec will be executed. So this Hello is only read here and only used here, down there. OK? At that point, we are concatenating hello with what? With the string content 
of a variable that no longer exists because the my name variable existed in the past when I called the greeter function here or when I called the greeter function there. By the way, in the first time, this my name was one variable, and the second time, this is another variable. Every time you call a function, their local variables are different, right? A new, a fresh copy of the local variables. So, this body of this function here, when we call it down there, should uh, still access the value of a variable that no longer exists. This is the closure. We are keeping that value, not the variable, the value pointed by the variable. We are keeping it alive because this function will need it later. So actually, when we call the greeter function, what you see, there's the ton, is stored here, and then it's forgotten. The, string, the name ton is lost after we execute this function. Would be lost normally, okay? Don't look at the inner function. If you read this code, you see, okay, where does name go? To a local variable, which is then destroyed at the return statement. But, I, an inner function still holds a reference to that value. And so the inner function is not a pure function that does its computation, square the number, square its argument. It's a function that internally keeps a reference to a value even when the variable pointed to that variable will cease to exist, will disappear. So this function here, hello Tom, points to an object, a function, that internally points to another object, which was the value of the my name variable. So the reference from the function to that object keeps the object alive. We will not be able to refer to that object anymore because the, the variable doesn't, for accessing that doesn't exist anymore, but the function itself will remember that reference. Okay, so this internal, this closure, this internal reference, we are closing the uh, variable my name inside the nested function, and this nested function will remember that specific value. So, last step. The local variable is different every time we call the function. We call it the first time, create an object Tom. Tom is stored into my name. And the function is a closure over this object, a string called Tom, the current value of the variable my name, called my name, temporarily called by name because it will disappear. So we have this variable that keeps alive some lexical scope in the outer function. Some definitions that normally would die are kept alive because they are needed by an inner function. Until this inner function itself uh, lives. Huh? When this inner function is also forgotten because maybe uh, the, this function here will close, will finish, uh, or everything will be garbage collected. But as long as we have a reference to a function that refers to a closed object, a closure, that object is kept alive. But also the hello variable is a local variable into a function. And this means that every time we execute this function, this will be a different variable pointing to a different object. So we are, every time we call this function, greeter, we are actually building Every time, a new and different function. Every time we call it, we create a new function. They all have the same body, but they are different. And they are different, especially because internally, they have the reference to a different uh, my name object. So the lexical body is identical. The, the statements are the same. But the meaning of my name 
inside this execution of the, of, the, of the function will be different every time. Because every time it will catch the value of a different value, of a different object there. Okay? So, in a way, this inner function is capturing some state of the outer function because maybe it needs to reuse it later. And in fact, we have two customized functions. One, hello Tom, which is only able to print hello Tom. And hello Jerry is only able to print hello Jerry. And what is the knowledge about Tom and Jerry was the argument that we passed to the greeter function when we built the greeter itself. So we are baking this string into this value and build a function that is customized for Tom. Then we are building a similar function that will be customized for Jerry. These are two copies, two instances, two objects with the same body, but internally that refer to different remembered objects, remembered through, through closure. Huh? So it's something that in which a syntactic, uh, syntactical uh, uh, nesting, so this function is inside that one, which is basically a visibility issue, is transformed into a semantic behavior, a value being remembered later on and a function being customized. So the syntax is new, no, it's very specific and very, a lot, uh, it's used a lot in JavaScript. Oh, it shouldn't surprise us very much. Because at the end, at the end what, we are, what are we doing? We are calling a function that returns something that can be called and remembers some state from the moment in which it was created. Well, that's a description of an object. When we create an object, then this object has some methods, and these methods can be called on that object, and they remember the values that we assigned at the creation time of the object. Okay, this is a bit more explicit <laughs> what we are doing here we see what is happening. But the idea of creating something with some parameters and having as a result an object that remembers the initial parameters and we can call methods on that is nothing new. Here we have a different way of expressing the same, say, uh, programming concept. And we see that objects and functions are very much linked thanks to this mechanism, okay? By the way, this is one way in which we can create objects without using classes. And we'll see that in a moment. Big warning, what we are returning here is the reference to the function and not the, the return value of the function. Okay, hello is the name of the function. We want to return the function object. We don't want to call the function yet. If we call the function yet, we would return a string. Because the function body will be executed, will be create a string, hello Tom, and if the first time, hello Tom here, would be a string, not a function. And so we won't be able to call it. It's no longer a function. Right? So remember that we're always aware of the difference of uh, storing or sending or passing around the reference to a function compared to calling the function and storing and using the result of the function itself. Hmm? Okay, but this is the explanation of what we did. And uh, saying that this Closure mechanism can be used to emulate the behavior of objects. We have, here we have an example. Huh? Uh, we have a function. Uh, we are not going to 
program in this way. We, are, we will be using uh, real objects, but let's see what's happening here. A function counter that creates a counter object. What is a counter object? It's something that every time I call uh, uh, next or get next, I will get uh, an increasing value. Okay? So actually, I am building a function for incrementing a value. Uh, if you forget about the function syntax, uh, you are seeing an object where we are declaring an, a local property and a method for updating that. The, the issue here is that the value of the, the state of the object uh, is not kept into an object itself because we have no, not all, an object, we are it's just kept inside the, the closure of the inner function. But what we are doing here is the same as before. We are creating a function. This function refers to a value, which is remembered. And it's just one object is remembered across calls. It's not a local variable of get next. A local variable of get next will be reset every time we call the get next function. We want it to persist, so it should be outside get next. It should be a global variable. But not a real global variable. We, we don't like those global from the point of view of get next, something outside it, so that it will survive the different calls of the get next. So we create this variable value outside the function, and then we give it to the function and say, okay, work on this. And this will be the same value every time. And we turn the function, which is, a, we can be, which remembers the value, and whenever we execute this body, the value is incremented. So the function itself returns a value, the number. The counter is a constructor, can we call it in this way, that creates a, a counter. So we can create one counter object here, count one, and we can call it many times, one, two, three, and it will print one, two, three. Because this count one is a, an instance of this get next function. And it has, it remembers its own private copy of a variable that was called value. And if we call counter again, it will create another counter, another object, another function that is bound to another copy of value, another lo local global <laughs> variable, they will be incremented. So these two will be independent. Hmm? So very similarly with what we do with objects and constructors. And in this case, a counter is very simple because we can only, we need only to call one method on a counter, next. And so we can store the state of the, let, let me call it object, the state of the object inside the function using the closure mechanism. But what if we want to make this counter more intelligent and uh, let it maybe increase or reset the counter? So we need two different functions. But these two functions should uh, refer to the same value. Hmm? Uh, return, we need to return two functions bound to the same value. Returning to function is possible, but, but since the return statement should only return a value, where do we put these functions? We can put them into a JavaScript object. Objects are very easy, we saw before, okay? Just name, value, name, value. So what we are building here is uh, an object, we are returning an object. Braces are creating an object. This object has two properties, count and reset. Okay? The values of these properties are functions. And these functions, they both have a closure on the same surrounding variable, n. So we are building an object 
that has two properties, both of them are functions, and both of them internally contain a reference to the same object called n. Okay, so these are the properties of the object and these are the methods of the object. By the way, the value n is hidden, is not accessible outside uh, this function or this function, because the variable itself doesn't exist anymore. It's not the same as putting n inside the object. We could also put value equal to zero here, and then increase it from, the, from, from this function. But then it will be an attribute which is visible inside the object. And so in this case, what, what, well, uh, we can do the same, play the same game. We can create counter. This time it doesn't return a function, but an object with two property functions. So for the counter, we can call C dot count. So C is the object that has a count property. So we can C dot count is the property. The property is a function itself, so we can call it. And we return, the first time you return a zero and then increment. It's a post increment here. The second time we call, uh, uh, then we have the other object counter. Again, it will have a different instance of n. And so the method count. Uh, of object D will increase another N, so the private copy of N for D. We can also call reset on one of these objects, and then uh, they will, this will put N to zero, of course, DN bound linked inside the, the function reset. This function reset, which is that one that has been created uh, for C, when we created the object C. So actually, we have N of object C and the another N for object D, and we can operate on them independently. And so again, if we count on C and count on D, we see this time 0 and 1, because D went, uh, went forward, and C was just be, has been, just been reset. So we have another 0. Okay, so we are building step by step. We are just using uh, this very single feature. We can nest one function inside another, and then the rest is the consequence of the, the object model of having a variable separate from its uh, object. And this object can be a function. Okay, so the, the concept is only these ones. These are the consequences. What we can do with the language, thanks to the fact that it's been designed in this way. Uh, we skip this too. And this final step of this uh, line of, uh, of study is uh, a special type of functions that try to help us to automate this mechanism that we just saw by building a function that returns an object that contains methods that modify variables. It's a long chain of thoughts. This has been collapsed into a concept which, which is called the constructor functions in JavaScript. What is a constructor function? It's a normal function that by convention starts with a capital letter in this name. It look like, looks like a class name, doesn't it? With a capital letter and is designed to be called with the new keyword, with the new keyword. So instead of calling the function normally, a constructor function is called with a special syntax. New, name of the function. It starts to look more and more like a class. But it's a function. What does the new keyword do? The new keyword creates an empty object, open and close brace, and injects this empty object into the body of the function with a name called this. 
So the body of this function, not because it has a capital letter, because it's being called with the new keyword, it is a function, so it receives some parameters. It has some body, it can do whatever it wants. But in addition, it has a special local variable called this, which is a reference to a new, hence the new keyword, to a new empty object. An empty object is just there for us to fill with the properties that we need. So we are, we don't create an object ourselves, like for example here, we are creating an object here. No, it's already been created, it's empty, we add uh, attribute properties. We can add uh, value properties, like this one, we are storing these three values, or we can create a function properties. Call them methods if you want. So a constructor function is a normal function that is expected to be called with a new keyword. So it's expected to have a, internally to use the, this variable and to populate this, this variable with the attributes, value attributes, and methods, function attributes. They are all attributes of, of an object, so they can be functions or values. And there is no return statement here because it's implicit. Actually, we don't need to return anything because the statement here reads my car equal new. So what we are returning is the this object that we created. The new keyword already builds the object and returns it. The function is only used to fill this object, this newly created object with some attributes. So we don't need to return the object. The object has been, is already returned by the new keyword. This is just to fill it. So a constructor function is a function that does something before, something after our code. Before it creates a new object, it calls it this, and after it returns this object to the caller. Other than that, it will just execute our code. Okay? So these three go hand in hand, a capital letter from the function, the this object inside, and the new keyword for calling it. So it's a special syntax that makes us, makes it easier to do games like this. And it saves us for, for thinking explicitly about closures and when a variable disappears or stuff like that, which is not difficult, but heavy, let's say, to, to think of. Okay, so that would be the way, and the reason why we are saying that in JavaScript we can use objects uh, without classes. We don't need classes when we have functions that works in, the way, in this way. Huh? A function that is customized to create an object, right. Well, JavaScript also has classes, but if you dig and maybe we'll also use them. If, but if you dig a bit, uh, you see that cl the class keyword is just a syntactic variation on top of this. The reality is here. Hmm? Uh, if you want to dig, you will discover the keyword prototype and the meaning of prototype properties inside objects. Uh, it's a long journey. <laughs> it's rewarding because you really understand how the language is working is not really needed for writing code. Huh? But just for understanding how the object model works, uh, where we have objects without classes, but they can inherit from another, one another through a so-called prototype chain. I won't bore you with that, but it's very interesting. OK. Let's try to put this into a bit of practice. Uh, what is it? Good. Um, we are proposing an, uh, an exercise for this week here called exercise three, because the, the other ones were one and two, uh, that builds upon the, the idea of the question and answer that we had. And is asking 
for us to create some objects and then provide some behavior from them, okay? So let's start by creating the objects. And then we need some extra information for, about the behavior because it's asking us to, um, what is that? Using JavaScript objects, uh, we know those, and functional programming methods, we don't, uh, we don't know them yet, okay? So right now the methods cannot be, we, we are not able to implement the methods, we will do that in the next hour. But for, for the moment, let's start to, okay, prepare the, the framework of the objects. So, sorry, let me zoom it a bit. Um, so, first of all, we want to properly define these objects about questions and answers. We already used uh, you know, uh, arrays and uh, plain objects or numbers uh, uh, last week, uh, but now we can do it properly. We didn't, we didn't know objects yet. So we just, just used the arrays, arrays of numbers. Okay? Right now, we can do that in a proper way. So we need to create uh, an object of type answer and an object of type question. Let me use uh, the word type, okay? It's not real JavaScript, but an object create, created by a constructor function answer, okay? Let's call it an answer object. Hmm? So uh, let's open a file called uh, Q&A or whatever. No, let's call it, uh, okay, exercise three solution, X3. Uh, let me just uh, name this file not x3.js, but mjs. The reason for this M uh, will be apparent. Uh, uh, it's about uh, M stands for module, okay? There's a, a module system in, for importing and exporting modules that works differently in Node.js uh, according to the extension of the file. Let's not talk about this for the moment, okay? We just keep the habit uh, of calling this uh, MJS, which has two consequences. We'll see them in more detail, but the first consequence is that uh, uh, it uh, specifies there are two different syntaxes for importing modules. And one works with JS extension, the other works with uh, MJS extension. We are using the, the second one because it's uh, more recent, it's more modern, and also the same that works in the browser when we, work, when we are going to write JavaScript in the browser. So let's keep this, let's learn this way, okay? And the second consequence of uh, calling that with MJS uh, extension is that uh, automatically it enforces a strict mode. So we don't need to write a use strict anymore if our file is called mjs instead of j just plain js. Okay, so that's good for us. Then, what we're going to do is to create a constructor function, uh, where's the text here, for building an answer object. So it means that we can define a function answer with some arguments that should be the response text, uh, the username, uh, the score, and a date. Okay, so the, I already forgot. The response, the username, or use just user, the uh, score, and the date. Okay, so capital letter A tells us that I'm going to use uh, this as a constructor function, not as a regular function, so I'm expecting on this object uh, to be filled. Uh, this is the response. We are creating a property called the response inside the new object uh, by copying the response argument. 
Uh, you see what uh, Josh, uh, Visual Studio is, is telling me, well, you're building a constructor function. If you want, I can rewrite it as a class. They are, they are the same. It depends just on the syntax that you prefer. This dot user equal to user. This dot score equal to score. This dot date, whatever it is, equal to date. Okay. And then we can try to use it, test it. Answer one is new answer with a response uh, yes. A user, uh, Fulvio, maybe myself, score is five. Whatever, and the date, uh, let's imagine it's today, 2024, 312. Console.log, A1. So, does it work? Let's see. We are inside the week two folder, node. X3. And this uh, printing an object. So this is the, the syntax for printing a normal JavaScript object. There's nothing special, it's just a JavaScript object that somehow also remembers who created it. So it's not a class, but it's near a class. An object that remembers is what is what is was created by the answer constructor function. Okay. Uh, and it's just no, what do you say? An object with some uh, value properties. We don't have any methods. We didn't create any methods here. If we need to create some methods. We can just do that. I want to create a method for, for example, increasing the score, vote up, this dot vote up, would be a function that, uh, let's use the arrow function, that just increases the score and doesn't return anything. It's a property of type function. Let's call it a method. But that doesn't require any argument. And uh, every time we call it, it will increase this value. And so right now we can at this point a one dot what up. And then see what happens. Answer one, we print it again. And what does it do? Sorry, I didn't save it. I always forget saving. So what do we have? We have the previous answer, which is uh, the previous object with score five. And we see that we have an, an extra attribute right now, which is the fun the what up function, and that the console.log just prints me. This is a function that is it's anonymous, it doesn't have a name. The function itself, the property that we use to call the function is what up. And after we call the what up, the same object with the same value for everything except the score, which is now same. Oh, of course, this is JavaScript, so every attribute is public. So there's nothing that would prevent us just to write a1.score++. Okay. We don't need methods just for reading or modifying attributes, attribute values. All attributes are public and can be just read and written. There's no private attribute or something like that. Okay. 
but of course it's better, more explicit to have methods for manipulate the object, especially if the operations of the objects are non-trivial or are conditional, or, uh, you know the score. Okay, this is the easy way or the normal way. What if we forget new? Just to understand what, uh, what is happening, what kind of uh, error message we can expect. I forgot to write new here. It's a function, we call it the function. What does it happen? It happens that the function is called, but uh, this statement, which is the first time inside the function, creates an exception because the object this doesn't exist. Okay? Uh, we are assuming that in the body of the function we have access to this, but only if it has been called in, in the right way with the new keyword. Otherwise, the problem is not, you see that the error is not here. When I'm calling the function at this at line 10, JavaScript doesn't know if that is a constructor function or is a normal function. Okay, there's the convention of the capital letter, but it's only between me and us, me and you, only between us. It's not <laughs> specification of the language. So the function is called normally, and normally we just call a function by giving the parameters. And uh, in the body of the function, on the other way, we are expecting to have an object being created by us, for us, by the new keyword, but the object is not there. And so the error that we get is strange because we said that the error is uh, cannot set properties of undefined. Undefined who? This. That this keyword is not defined because it hasn't been initialized to a new empty object by the new keyword. And just remember that undefined uh, Never read it as a, as a part of the sentence, but it's always the name of an object. Hmm? Uh, you are trying to set the property response to an object that doesn't exist. It's like uh, null dot something. Hmm? It's undefined dot something. It's undefined because nobody ever created this, huh? Did this object. So this is how JavaScript is telling us that, uh, and of course we can also have uh, local variables here, okay, const, uh, uh, I don't know, category equal to something, I don't know, I don't know computer science for this answer. Okay, the difference is that if we have local variables are just like that, local variables. And we don't, uh, they are not stored into the object, uh, they are not remembered. Okay, so if we run it, you see that the local variables are not put into the object, only the prop, only this is survives. Okay. If we have a local variable, we can make it survive uh, without a name uh, if we are using that uh, inside some of the methods with the closure mechanism. So we can decide whether to remember some values by creating attributes to the object or creating local variables that uh, will be remembered here. For example, you have a method uh, get category. We can just, for example, re return a category. Sorry, the braces. And in this case, uh, we can call this method. Get category. And uh, you see that the object doesn't contain the category property, 
but uh, get category is able to remember the function itself is able to remember the reference to the object through the closure mechanism and return its value. So it's a way if we want to hide some internal property that will still be accessible by methods, value function, uh, value, uh, function value attributes, we call them methods, but not true regular attributes of the object. It's up to us. Both mechanisms work in the same, similar ways. Hmm? Mm. If we don't have any special reason to hide them, <laughs> regular properties are fine with the disk. So that we can see them, we can debug them, but also the closure is working. Hmm? Okay. Um, the second part of the essay exercise calls for, uh, the same calls for creating a constructor function question to represent a question that contains another object, text of the question, user, date, and list of answers. So we can add a second object here, function question that uh, has a text of the question, as the user asking it, as the date, and has the um, list of answers. No, I don't have to build them because that will be added one by one. I don't provide the list of answers when I create a question. The question will start with zero answers, and then I will add them one by one. So when I build a new question, I store the text the user, the data, date with E, and we create the answers as an empty list. We can use a, an array for managing the list. And then, these are just properties. What about the methods? Uh, for example, we have uh, one uh, method called add we, that we must implement. Add answer uh, receives a, full, sorry, a fully constructed answer object uh, and will add it to the list of answers to this question. to populate the list of answers. So we can implement a method here. For example, it's what's called, uh, sorry, my memory, add. So this dot add uh, is, a, is a function that receives an answer, an answer, a single answer. And we use this answer to append it to the list uh, of answers. So we are using, if we remember the arrays, the operation of the, uh, the method on the array is this, dot answers, plural, dot push of single answer. Okay, so it means that uh, we, now we can create uh, const uh, question one, a new question, are you happy? Very difficult question, user is always me, I'm asking myself, I'm trying to motivate myself. And uh, the date is always today, 2024, 03, 12. Console.log Q. 
u1. And then we try to use the add method on q1 to add uh, the answer number one to my question and see what comes out to question one. There's a question, yes? So you want to know when you have a variable and repeating the question uh, like Q1 or A1, what is its type? Yes. Uh, I think there's a, a function called, I don't remember if it's type or type of, uh, sorry if my confusion between, uh, between Python and JavaScript, uh, that will return the, the, the string representation of it. Let's. Uh, uh, Yes, type of this one. So let's see it if I want here to print console.log type of q1. So let's see what it what it comes out. So type of is an operator that takes an object and returns a string. So now the output is a bit longer. We start from here. OK, it's just object right now, because not uh, the, oh, I come later. Because. So what do we have here? Uh, what do we have here is, uh, sorry, Q1 is a new question. And uh, we have here the body of the first uh, object that contains also an answer uh, list, an array, it's empty. Then after we call the add instruction here, we print it again, the same question, and we see that now answers, that was an empty array, now it's an array containing uh, one object uh, that is uh, the first answer object. Right now, it's just printing all the details of this answer. Console.log is trying to give us all the details. And we see that we have this add function that is working on that. OK? And every time we, we call add, of course, this list will grow. The other methods for uh, so implementing the other methods that are defined in the exercise, we need to learn a bit about uh, functional methods. So we'll do that in the next hour. Um, why I'm going to spend uh, the end of the first hour, so the next uh, 15 minutes, uh, talking about uh, an easier stuff, which is dates. Right now, in the date field, I just put some strings. Okay. Hopefully, well-formatted strings so that the dates are not ambiguous in the ISO format here month and day, but the real question is uh, how can we handle dates for real uh, in JavaScript? Okay. It turns out that the JavaScript language has a date object predefined in the starter library, but it's not very well designed. Hmm? Uh, the date object in JavaScript, uh, oh, remember that JavaScript was invented in a couple of weeks, uh, um, is just uh, just copy over from the C library. So it's just uh, a number of milliseconds from uh, the January 1st, 1970, like the normal uh, meaning of the time in, in C without uh, any objects. And uh, it's, uh, it's a point in time. It's an instant. OK, we can count the millisecond from that day. But even like that, it's ambiguous. OK, January the 1st, when? At midnight. OK, where? It doesn't say. Was it midnight in Italy? Was it midnight in California? In Greenwich? It doesn't say. 
JavaScript doesn't say. And so actually, it's ambiguous. Uh, January the 1st, uh, now we have, uh, okay, we are still in winter time, but in summertime, there will be one hour. So does we, that, do we count this, one, this hour or not? Hmm? So it's, uh, there's a lot of ambiguity with this definition of time when we take into account uh, time zone. And when we build a website, uh, we cannot expect every user to live and always have lived in our time zone. So this object works. We can create a, a date for the constructor, it's a new date, so the syntax of the constructor function, with a year, month, and day, hour, minutes, seconds, and uh, milliseconds. in a strange format because the months uh, started from zero is something that shivers me, but the days of the month instead of starting from one. So there's a lot of strange stuff in this object, okay? And it doesn't support time zones uh, and it's uh, formatting itself is uh, locally dependent. So when I'm printing this, uh, it can print in a different way and it can also, the constructor can, okay, this is a non-ambiguous way of constructing a date, but it can also pass a string or a string in a language. And uh, it can, they will be interpreted in different ways. So you would expect that, or I wouldn't expect a, a constructor to parse a string like that. But JavaScript tries to be friendly. Okay, if you write dates like that, we'll try to create a date object for you. The problem is that uh, these two dates that supposedly are the same, 18 of March 2020, we don't only remember those times, but okay, that was the date when they created these slides the first time. Bad memories come up. Um, but this one is actually midnight of the 18th, and this one is uh, 11 o'clock of the 17th. Because they were interpreting my local time zone, which is Italy, which is one hour shifted from the Greenwich time, the UTC time, they are interpreting that differently. So I'm creating this at midnight, the 18th in Italy, and also it was, it was stored at 11 of the day before in Greenwich. Don't ask me about the reason. It just works like this. It works, it's not unpredictable, but its behavior is really strange. It's documented, but we don't want to find, fight with documentation and stuff like that. Um, comparisons are difficult. Uh, uh, by the way, you always must uh, set times. So if you want to only specify a date, uh, and not a time, uh, the time figures are still there. Or if you only should specify the time and not the date, uh, you must set the year to zero and the, and the day of the month to zero. That must, doesn't make any real sense. So it's something that we're not, really, not really designed for that. And that was the reason why a lot of libraries uh, started to appear to say, OK, hey, let's not use the, the date object from the standard library. Let's define something more more sane of mind, okay? And there were different uh, libraries. Uh, they are the, these are the most popular ones. Uh, we, we have just seen the, the AJS one, for example. Uh, but if you want to use one or the others, are, they are different. Uh, one that was very, very um, popular was MomentJS. And then it started to get a lot of shame <laughs> from people because they said it was too large, too many kilobytes, and so on. We don't want to download all of the stuff. And so there was sort of a, <laughs> of a, um, of a race to make the smallest uh, date library possible. Mm. Crazy people, crazy things people do in open source. OK, I don't care. Let's focus on the JS. The JS is a small library uh, available from this uh, website. And uh, where you find also the documentation 
fast two kilobytes alternative to moment JSON. You see how they're selling that. Okay, this is small. Okay, we don't care about that too much, uh, but at least we have some documentation to work with. First of all, okay, this is a simple library that creates an object uh, of type DJS uh, with some methods. Uh, that will be the easy part. The interesting part is how do we use an external library? Okay, it's easy to say, okay, that, that's the library you want to use. We can download it if you want. Where do we put it? Uh, how do I use it? So, how do we use external libraries or modules in JavaScript? Okay, good. The answer is that uh, JavaScript has a, a package eco ecosystem of modules that can be managed uh, project by project uh, by different possible tools. Uh, the most famous one is NPM. NPM Node Package Manager. So this NPM program is uh, uh, used to manage the packages needed by a JavaScript program. So you will have your code plus some packages that will be being uh, uploaded, uh, downloaded, and uh, available, made available to your project. To do that, you must first uh, initialize NPM on your project. Okay? You say, okay, my project is not made, not only made of my files, but also I need some packages. So in the terminal, in the folder where I have, I must say, okay, I want to initialize this initialize the project in the current folder, okay? So if you have different projects, make them, you know, save them in different folders. NPNIMIT is asking you some questions. The name of the package, exercise three. The version, one is fine with me. Description, exercise three. Entry point. So the end point should be the, the file that we are going to call, okay, the main file. If a main JavaScript file, where is the pro start? In this case, we call it ex3.mjs. Test command, we don't have any test command. Git repository, for the moment, we don't have one. Okay, it's asking use, useless questions, okay? At the end, we say yes. Basically, all the questions were useless, but the effect was the creation of a file called package.json. We could create it by hand if you wanted. Package.json is a, just a, a file containing the, an object describing the answers to my questions, to the questions that we had before. The presence of a package.json makes a, a a folder, a directory, uh, turns it into a project. And in this project, uh, we can install external packages by using npm install commands that will download and install uh, packages from the npm library. npm is a package library with, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands uh, of, um, no, is, is this? Yeah. For example, DJS. It's a repository of libraries. Okay, like uh, PIP, uh, PyPy for Python uh, and so on. Uh, NPM is a repository of packages for for the NPM program of JavaScript. And you can find all of them uh, with the search engine, documentation, or whatever you want. So I want to enable my package to use the DJS library. Fine. I need to install it. So after I initialize the package, NPM, install, and name of the package, DJS. This will create a folder called node modules, and inside these node modules, 
it will download some internal files plus the library you wanted, the JS in this case. Um, in this case, the JS is small, so it only downloaded that. In the case of larger or more complex packages, it will download the package you specified plus all the dependencies. So maybe you make one install command and uh, have 50 packages downloaded. Hmm? May happen. It, all the dependencies are transitively found and downloaded. And installed inside node modules. This also created a new package, so the install created a, a, a new file, sorry, called package-block.json. So let's see what happened. The package.json has been updated with a dependencies property that lists all the packages that they installed in this project. It was not there before. The install added this line, these three lines. Every time I install something, a new dependency is added there. So I have the, the, the picture of exactly which packages are needed there. So if I give you my project with the um, package.json file, you can just write a command npm install. It will read the, the package.json and install exactly those packages. So it's an easy way of transferring projects to other people your JavaScript file and the package.json file. Everybody will just pick it and then write npm install without any arguments. It will just install everything that you specified in the dependencies. In addition, it also created a package.log.json that uh, uh, specified the, version, the specific version number that have been installed because maybe npm, the packages are changing every day. And so I want to be sure that you are using the same version that I downloaded in my project. So package, dot, uh, package lock remembers the version numbers, while package only remembers basically the, in this case, it's also being uh, said of this one or greater. But in some cases, you want to lock them. This one is. Uh, can be deleted and rebuilt if you want to update your packages, uh, but they, the, the two go hand in hand, basically. And the, the presence of these two files uh, allows us for the repeatability of project installation. You move this file, so uh, in, when you're saving your project, uh, you must uh, commit uh, this to, to GitHub, for sure. And you should never commit to GitHub the node modules folder because it will grow very large. So never commit it. It's also uh, um, platform dependent. You don't want to commit it. It's too large. It's platform dependent. It will take a lot of time. It contains thousands of files normally in a normal project. And it can be rebuilt just by writing npm install. So there's no reason at all to save it somewhere. OK, so right now we have uh, prepared our project to use this library. So we install the library. And so we can now um, import. So why is that? No, sorry. The import it and use it. Why is that? Okay. For example, the, the statement here is uh, the beginning, we can import a library. Uh, no, that's not right. Okay. We are importing the library, a name. And then we can use it uh, for creating objects. So we can only import a library that we have installed in our project, of course. And after importing it, uh, we can use uh, its objects, its functions uh, uh, inside our code. So we'll use it for creating a story and comparing dates in, the, in this case. Okay? Um, the, we'll see the methods of DJS after the break. 
but uh, I want just to mention that uh, there are two ways, two different syntaxes, two different ways of uh, importing and managing packages in JavaScript because historically, Node.js used a mechanism called require. Okay, when Node.js was invented, they also invented a mechanism for managing the packages. This package management was a server-side invention. Wasn't there in the, in, the, in the front end. And so it was using this require method. Then later on, the, the more recent versions of JavaScript, uh, they defined the import keyword, the import and export. And they, they were implemented uh, first uh, in the browsers. But Node.js remained uh, on using the require. So basically we had, for every package, we have two versions. One that was using the import statement and the other that was in the require function. And we are still living there. After many years, there are still you know, these two standards uh, that on the client side, on the browser, there's no problem. We use import and that's it. On the server side, uh, we may use require or so the node version all the, or the standard version with import. And uh, that is the reason why earlier I called this file with the extension MJS. MJS tells, uh, is one of the three ways of telling Node, uh, use the import syntax. With normal JS extensions, Node would assume that we want to use uh, the older required syntax. Okay, so you can either use uh, their equivalent, okay? And most of the packages in the NPM store now have two versions. So they can be both required or imported. The library builders have made some complexity to support both of them, but it's their job in, the, in this case. So it's up to you. Either you use uh, the JavaScript JS extension and learn and use the require syntax or you prefer to use the import syntax and then you just remember to call your name with uh, MJS. Okay, that was just uh, the motivation for what we had before. Okay, so I think now it's time for a break and then we'll try to implement the dates and implement other functionality. See you in uh, 15 minutes or 11.50.